Okay, so today's lecture is on Jamaica Kincaid's Girl. It's actually um, a, a great short story. I really, really like it. Uh, it's very special in a lot of ways. Um, the only thing that I will say is that um, you should probably be in at least seventh or eighth grade if you're going to read this, or you should ask parental permission to read it. You can have your parents read it first. It's only one page long. It's very, very short, but it does have one controversial word. Um, you can still do the notes, even if your parents don't want you reading the story, but um, that, that's just kind of like a warning first um, and it's linked right here you'll see it's very very short I can scroll oh that was the whole story look at how short it is okay so it's a very very short story um, and I, I really really enjoy it so first a little background on Jamaica Kincaid um, that's actually not her real name in case she was born in Antigua she's now a professor of African-American studies um, at Harvard Okay, and she is such an avid gardener that she was actually a gardening uh, correspondent for Architectural Digest for a couple different decades, for a couple of decades now. Okay, um, sh this whole idea of Jamaica Kincaid was originally a pseudonym, okay, uh, which means a false name. So pseudopod would be like false footed, pseudoscience is like not real science. So initially, she this was a pseudonym, it was a false name. Her birth name is Elaine. Potter Richardson, and she published under Jamaica Kincaid to preserve some anonymity. Okay, she also chose Jamaica, like the country, uh, as her first name to kind of like bring more attention to some of the things that she wanted to write about. And I wanted to feature really quickly some of my favorite pseudonyms. I have a lot. Um, I really love that J.K. Rowling wanted to prove that she could still get published even outside of the Harry Potter world, and that she eventually um, published as uh, Robert Galbraith, even though later on she revealed that, you know, Robert Galbraith is actually the same as Harry Potter creator J.K. Rowling. I really love that when Benjamin Franklin was 16 years old, he became Silence Do Good, which was supposed to be this middle-aged uh, widow who was writing all these rules and um, observations, okay? Um, and then I actually also really like, and this one is not appropriate for you guys to be reading, but um, I just like the story behind this. Eloisa James is a pen name for Mary Bly. And the reason I like this story is that she's actually a Shakespearean professor at Fordham University. It's a top 100 university but she also writes kind of trashy romance she's very very popular and romance and trashy romance is kind of a very uh, lucrative genre it makes a lot of money it's she's very very popular her books are really well researched um, but she because she was this Oxford educated Shakespearean professor for a long time she didn't want to really reveal that she was also a romance writer okay and again you guys are too young for her books but um, I just thought it was a really interesting reveal for her because she was kind of saying despite the fact that I'm a you know Oxford educated professor I also write romance and I'm proud of both my identities and even though I'm saying trashy romance I read her stuff so you know I feel like it's it's fun sometimes we all need some escapist literature escapist reading and um, it was a really interesting move for her when she like kind of came out I thought it was really brave of her too okay uh, sometimes you either have a pseudonym or you even not even have a pseudonym but you haven't really changed your name because of religious vows uh, uh, so Mother Teresa, and there is uh, a link there as well, was born, I don't actually know how to pronounce this, um, but this was her, her birth name, okay? And she eventually chose Teresa, you, you choose a name um, after she took her uh, vows, okay? And then sometimes you might choose a pseudonym because you're... Um, too young, okay, so maybe it's meant to be um, a little bit more meaningful. So William Lloyd uh, Garrison, he was a, a really, really, really famous abolitionist. Uh, when you want to abolish something, you want to get rid of it, okay? And he was a famous abolitionist, which means he wanted to abolish or get rid of slavery and emancipate, meaning free the slaves. He actually started to write about his beliefs when he was just 13 years old. So earlier we said Benjamin, you know, Franklin was 16 years old when he became Mrs. Silence Do Good, but here's William Lloyd Garrison, a famous abolitionist, um, writing and publishing um, under um, a, a pseudonym when he was just 13 years old. And he chose to publish under um, an Athenian politician who was nicknamed the Just. So this was a very meaningful, meaningful nickname, which I thought was great. Okay. Um, and Jamaica Kincaid, in this case, she chose it initially because she wanted some amount of uh, anonymity. She didn't want people to know who she was writing, but uh, you know who she was as a writer. But eventually, she actually adopted this as her legal name as well because it really was more who she was. Uh, she was one of four children 
children. She had a very fractious relationship. Um, fractious is kind of like, oh, I just really like this picture of fractious. Fractious is when you kind of like fight a lot, you're kind of irritate, irritable, et cetera. Uh, I just really like that link, so I put it there. Okay, and so she had a very fractious relationship, specifically with her mother, but really I think with her whole family, and so that influences some of the themes. Um, and it's a really interesting story to me for a lot of reasons. One is that it's only one sentence long. The entire story, which fills one page, is just one pet sentence long. There's a bunch of like semicolons, but um, you know, oh, is it more than one sentence? I might be wrong about that. It might actually have a break in it because the daughter speaks back. But it's basically it's one very long paragraph. I should have said one paragraph because then for sure I'm correct. It's one long paragraph, okay, and it may or may not be one sentence. Oops, okay, um, and it is also told from the second person, which is so rare, okay, so instead of saying, I believe in this, my, you know, call me Ishmael is the famous first line of Moby Dick. Instead of being in a first person or a third person where you're describing someone else, she did this, he did this, okay, it's told from the second person, which is the you. You should go do this. You should go think this, and I feel like there's not a whole lot of literature out there that's in the second person, in part because it, it can get a little awkward after a while. There's kind of this distance because they're saying things like, you went and did this, and you're thinking, wait, I, I didn't do that. Why is it telling me I did that? Okay. Um, but it's, it's a really good example. There's a couple other good examples if you want them. This is a really, really hugely award-winning fantasy series. I truthfully cannot finish it. Uh, my husband did finish it. I cannot finish it because it's, it's actually, I mean, it's the way the world ends again um it's really really depressing i was tearing up just trying to get through the first chapter and i said i <laughs> i can't do this um i read the spoilers and the summaries because i can't stand not to know what happens um and it's very very it's very very well regarded i think almost all of my friends who have read it really like it and say it's fantastic fantasy um it's just a little too depressing for me okay um and i will also mention that another one that is actually second person is Carmel. Alexander, okay, and he wrote the, his book on soccer is actually in the second person, and we can see that. You can say, you know, after playing, you know, online with Kobe till 1.30 a.m. last night, you wake this morning to the sound of mom arguing on the phone with dad, okay? So it's, it's another thing, you know, like, did you make your bed? Yeah, can you put, you know, bananas in my pancakes, please? Did you finish your homework? So, you know, it's, it's um, you know, again, I think Kwame Alexander is an excellent young adult author, and, um, you know, I, I can't can't find because he's you know still living and he published this more recently um, it's hard for me to find a complete work of it that's legal um, but you know I, I did link to a sample if you'd like to uh, read a little bit more Kwame Alexander because he's just quite great so some common Jamaica Kincaid themes. One is kind of a Caribbean uh, culture and identity. You'll see this is a theme I like a lot. Just like in Amy Tan's Two Kinds and all of her other stories from Joy Luck Club dealt with either Chinese immigrants as well as first, Chinese, first generation Chinese Americans struggling to come to terms with various themes. Jamaica Kincaid highlights West Indian culture. And I think I left a link there because I think not everybody kind of knows what that means. So here's kind of your West Indies. So she really is trying to highlight, um, and here's Jamaica, okay, uh, in that lower corner there. Um, she's trying to highlight West Indian culture and something you see um, even in her choice of name, because that, that's kind of why she's Jamaica Kincaid, all right? Uh, and the longer the shelter in place lasts, the more you'll see that, that that's a theme that I'm really um, interested in as well. Um, and part of this is colonialism, okay? So uh, usually you guys only know this relative to the U.S. Um, until you formally studied it. But the U.S. we know started as 13 original colonies, and we know that eventually we win our independence from Britain through the American Revolutionary War. Okay, uh, but that doesn't mean there still isn't colonialism. There's quite a bit of colonialism spread out in like different ways. Um, there are uh, places that are still ruled by Britain that are considered kind of British colonies. There, there's all sort of, there's a whole spectrum of ones um, with Britain because Britain is much older than the U.S. Okay, um, but there are also uh, a lot of people who would say that Puerto Rico is actually um, still being treated today um, as as a U.S. colony. Okay, that they um, 
don't quite have the uh, independence that they really should, okay? And see, you know, Wikipedia, not, not that you should go by Wikipedia, um, but Wikipedia will say it's an unincorporated U.S. territory, which means they kind of like lack the rights of um, the others, uh, the places that we would consider states, okay? Uh, and a lot of people, including the United Nations, much more trustworthy source, okay, uh, still debate whether or not Puerto Rico, in, Puerto Rico is treated as a colony of the U.S. because they're all American citizens, yet they don't, you know, vote, that they, they don't really have the same representation that they ought to as um, full citizens, even though, you know, they, they are. So, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in Jamaica Kincaid stuff, especially as it relates to colonialism. And one of the really major themes is this idea of establishing the worthiness of Caribbean identities, because often to be colonized, um, you know, you're kind of saying that whatever the indigenous or original culture there is somehow less worthy, okay? And so, you know, it's kind of like having your identities and your freedoms degraded and suppressed under traditionally European powers, but more, more now, all sorts of countries have had these kind of ongoing struggles. Um, it's, it's not a purely European or American thing. Uh, Asian countries have their own struggles with this as well. Another big theme within Jamaica Kincaid is this idea of power struggles, particularly mother and daughter, but really parent and child throughout her work. Uh, and this ties to a lot of the Parent expe parental expectations things we've talked about in other stories. In Powder by Tobias Wolf, it's actually the father who's not living up to the son's expectations because the father's sneaking them out, being irresponsible, keep, keeping them out late. He sneaks back some, he sneaks past some cops at some point. So in Powder, it's the father who's not living up to expectations. Um, in Two Kinds, I would say that the um, mother and daughter are not living up to each other's expectations. The mother wants the daughter to be a prodigy so that the daughter will be successful, but also so she can maybe just brag to her friends that she has a daughter who's a prodigy. And then the daughter kind of expects kind of, you know, don't expect anything and just say that I'm great, say that I'm beyond reproach all the time, okay? And then in Girls Can We Educate We Dads, uh, James Barry would say that the dads are not living up to the expectations that the daughters have, okay? Uh, and then Girl is basically one long list of rules. Don't do this, always do this never do this, um, do this, do this, that the mother is telling to our main protagonist. And a lot of people consider the daughter probably to be a young uh, Kincaid. So there's definite power struggle here happening as well and different expectations. And the mother-daughter relationship is something that Jamaica Kincaid has talked about in interviews as well, okay? She talks specifically about, you know, how it was her mother and her for a few years, and then there were kind of three new siblings that she got all at once. So it was like a brother and then another brother and then another brother okay and she she admits she says i don't know if having our other children was the cause of our relationship changing it might have changed as i entered adolescence but her attention went elsewhere and also our family money remained the same but there were more people to feed and to clothe and so everything got sort of shortened not only material things but emotional things the good emotional things i got the short end of that but then i got more things that i didn't have like a certain kind of cruelty and neglect so there's a lot to unpack here and she talks about how like becoming a writer she felt like she rescued herself. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting things here. One is that she admits that um, maybe the relationship was already changing because, you know, of adolescence. That's basically the entire time from when you're a child up until when you're an adult. We usually think of it as our teenage years, though technically it, it can encompass more than that as well. And relationships change during that time. You go from idolizing your parents and thinking that they're perfect and wonderful to slowly starting to, like, see some of the faults, like in Powder, where he sees some of his father's faults, okay? Um, to, you know, becoming your own adult with faults and problems and things like that. So, you know, she does kind of admit that maybe adolescence would have changed it anyway, but she seems at least a little jealous that there's this real sense of scarcity, that there's not enough time, not enough money, not enough attention that's the good intent, uh, attention that's maybe starting to go to her brothers, okay? And again, there's a lack, uh, there's a sense of class, lack of wealth, um, you know, scarcity, meaning not enough of things. 
that things, money and ability to buy even necessity, uh, necessities is lacking and that that causes a lot of fun, um, tension. And this is, you can decide if this is a fun fact or not, and you can click on the article if you want to, um, but it was done a few years ago, and I, I remember reading it and thinking, duh, but um, a recent survey found that, you know, 70% of couples argue about money more than anything else. So, you know, that, that's going to be a common theme in a lot of the stories that come up and a lot of real life news that comes up. And then the third theme I would say that she talks about are traditional gender roles. The mother in this story mostly wants, you know, her daughter to be a very, very traditional woman. Okay. All of the rules, uh, all of the rules revolve around things like how to, you know, wash the clothes. And then there's like different clothes for like white or colored. You're supposed to wash them on different days, how to walk, what to sing or not sing, you know, not to squat, all sorts of different rules here. Okay. That are mentioned in the story. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's an interesting sense that, um, well, so one, there's no sense that the daughter can or, you know, should be anything other than a eventual mother or any wife. Um, but I thought that this was an interesting one because it's, it's something that, uh, you know, as an older adult now, um, you know, it's, it's something that I've struggled with in my own life as well. Uh, my mother is highly educated. Uh, my grandparents were all highly educated. Some of them were teachers. Uh, one was a preacher. Um, but there was the sense that even though they wanted me to be educated and have my own life, that they were also very concerned that I was, you know, kind of simultaneously going to fulfill uh, the traditional role. And so there's a sense, I think, at least within my family, that yes, they want me to be independent and have a career, but at the same time, do all of the mother-wife things as well. And, and that can be a hard balance. And I would say even then, I'm lucky because, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged to kind of have both roles, and a, a lot of people really aren't. And in this story, the daughter is only encouraged to think in terms of really, really traditional roles. And that's really, really common as you get to kind of like older literature. Okay, to make could case this one was written in the 1970s but pride and prejudice which is much much older it's set in the 19th century okay um all the daughters can do it's it's a story about five daughters who are all kind of looking for husbands all the daughters are expected to do is to marry and to marry well okay and i will say jane austen the author actually never got married okay and this was her first book pride and prejudice was her first book it was initially called first impressions and she she wrote about afterwards, like in her letters, that Pride and Prejudice might have been her least favorite book, which is unfortunate because it's, um, for most people and for myself as well, one of her favorites, uh, one of our favorites, uh, and one of the most popular. But for a long time, she kind of said that, you know, she felt like she gave in too much to traditional gender roles and this idea that a poorer girl has to marry a richer husband, okay? Um, and, and that's all the woman can do in that. The mothers only care about marrying off the daughters, and the daughters only care about finding a husband. Um, and I would say a similar thing is true in Emma. She is wealthier, so she's not thinking she has to get married, but she spends most of her time trying to get everyone else around her married, and she herself will get married at the end. And this is slowly changing in new literature, and also people keep trying to take old literature and somehow make it more modern, sometimes in a really odd way. So Pride and Prejudice, um, there was this kind of rewritten book, and then that became a movie that was Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. So on the one hand, they want husbands. On the other hand, they're also fighting zombies. Um, and then sometimes it gets transformed into that this movie's kind of older now as well, but it, it's basically Emma. Okay, it's basically Jane Austen's story, but set in Beverly Hills as opposed to, you know, Brit old, old England. There's not actually a ton of vocabulary that I wanted to go over on this one. There's fritters, um, which is just fried dough, and you can put fried dough with vegetables. There's vegetable fritters. You can put fried dough with apples. The apple fritters look much better to me, okay? Um, there's also some that is culture-specific. Uh, Benna is a type of calypso music, and it's a song that her mother tells her not to sing. Um, and then this is a type of pudding, okay? So there was some, like, food in there. Uh, there's a quiz down here. If you don't read the story, you could still actually do most of the quiz, okay? Uh, again, the full notes are in the description down below, and I'll put the key there as well. Um, and it's really, again, a quiz on not just this story, but basically all the stories. Okay, that's it for today. Bye-bye.